All right. Uh, just a reminder that the, is it the seventh problem set is due on Friday? And it covers material that we've done. It's, uh, it's all about insulation. Uh, so clothing insulation, climate, I, that's essentially in our past now. Two, two uh, questions that came in. Um, one of them we, I talked about briefly last time, and I didn't, the other one's new. Um, back to the, to the ozone layer. I, I told you guys that, that, that climate, the, the, the climate problem that, that we're all um, experiencing now is, is due to putting complicated molecules in the atmosphere. That is, molecules that are more complicated than, than uh, two identical atoms. So oxygen and nitrogen, not part of the story. All the other ones, yes, part of the story. So those go up there and they darken the, the atmosphere and they ultimately affect climate. Uh, the other thing that came up, though, was about the ozone. So the crisis of, of essentially when I was your age, the crisis was the ozone layer. Um, and it, what's ca what caused that one? It, it is indeed, so I looked this up. I know, yeah, I've gone through some of this stuff and then I forget it or never went through it. It is caused by chlorine, and it's chlorine atoms. And where do the chlorine atoms come from? They are, they are knocked off of other molecules by sunlight. So getting, if you get chlorine up there in, in whatever molecule form you like, sunlight has enough energy in, it, in its various photons to, to free up chlorine atoms. And the chlorine atom is, is, the, is the killer. It goes to a to an ozone molecule, and ozone is oxygen three, so three oxygen atoms clinging together. Not a very happy camper, but it, but it, it exists. And the chlorine grabs onto one of the oxygen atoms, steals it, and leaves a normal oxygen molecule, just O2, good old fashioned O2. That chlorine oxide then grabs onto another chlorine oxide, makes a, a quartet, which then sunlight attacks again and knocks off a chlorine atom, and the cycle begins again. So chlorine cycling through this, you know, damaging an ozone molecule by stealing its oxygen, and then recycling and damaging another uh, ozone molecule. That was the problem, or is the problem. The solution is to keep chlorine out of, out of the upper atmosphere, and so we've basically stopped. There, there, there remain some chlorine molecules that are in common use, but I, I believe they've been, they're, they're carefully selected to be ones that don't cause this problem. For example, a lot of cleaning, dry cleaning is often done with perchloroethylene, which is full of chlorines, and evidently that one is not a serious problem for the ozone layer. So it's, it's around, in any case, people try to keep the chlorinated molecules out of the atmosphere to the best to the extent they can. So that was one question to deal with. The other question is, is uh, one I, I find just interesting. Uh, the question is asking about the mirroring of windows and laptop screens and the infrared. Is that why you can sometimes see reflections when it's dark? You, you, know, you see yourself in windows, right? You see your, I can see reflections in the, in the windows in this, in this room. That isn't due to the coating. That's just an effect that occurs when light enters or exits a glass surface, and it's an example of a, of a general phenomenon, which you might as well know about, and that is whenever a wave, a wave phenomenon, there are lots of wave phenomena, sound is a wave phenomena, light is a wave phenomena, ripples on the ocean are, are a wave phenomena. Whenever a wave makes a transition from a regime in, in which it travels at one speed to a regime in which it travels at a different speed, so it abruptly changes speed. At that surface, you get two, two interesting phenomena. Um, one of them is reflection, and one of them is refraction. Reflection is, in this case, it's a partial reflection. You get part of the wave that was coming in, instead of going into the new regime, uh, region where it travels at a different speed, part of it bounces off, and the other part enters. So that's reflection. Refraction is a bending effect as you go from one regime to the other. If you hit, if you hit the transition at an angle, it, there's a funny bend that occurs. Details for, you know, for a different, different period. But the, the partial reflection that occurs whenever sound, whenever sound, whenever a wave undergoes a transition speed is responsible for lots of things that you've seen. For example, echoes. You know, where, 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 where do echoes come from? You, slap, you go out in the, in the 
uh, old dorm quad or something, clap your hands, you'll hear your, your clap come back at you off all the brick walls. It's because sound travels at a different speed in air compared to in brick. And the transition, trying to get into the brick, is a tough one for sound. It, most of it reflects. And so the way it goes, boing, right off, right off it. I mean, probably can get echoes off these walls. Um, that's where it comes from. It's the sound trying to reflect, try, trying to enter a, a, a material in which it travels much faster. All right? Same with the phenomenon of the bouncing off windows. Every time light tries to go into glass in which it, 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 light travels faster in air than it does in glass. The famous, the speed of light, that's a, that's, that is the speed at which light travels in completely empty space. But it's, it, that it's associated with light, that special speed, it, it's special in this universe independent of light. It has nothing, only nothing to do with light. It's the boss. Light is an example of something that travels at its speed. So in empty space, light travels very fast, obviously. In everything else, it travels a little slower. It travels significantly slower in glass. I'm looking up at a piece of glass. Um, in glass than it does in air. And in making the transition into the glass from the air, and in making the transition from the glass back into the air, it reflects. And it's about a 4% reflection off of both of them. If it slowed down more, it would reflect more. But it's, you know, glass has a particular extent to which it slows the light down. Some other things slow light more, like diamond and zircon and uh, other chemicals that are interesting, but I'll set them aside. In any case, so you get partial reflections off of everything whenever light tries to, to, has to change speed. So for those of you who have glasses, and that is essentially almost no one, um, it'll happen someday. Hey, OK, Sam. Um, uh, it's nice to have anti-reflection coatings on the glasses, because glasses with just a bare, even a plastic, that, that transition from fast to slow to slow to fast gives about a 4% reflection, and it's kind of distracting. And whatever. So it is possible to help light get into and out of glass by putting special coatings on it. And so they're kind of standard these days. Years and years ago, they were, they were exotic. Now they're kind of like course, like no doubt you'd get them. All right, so far? So what about the, this, this funny mirroring in, in, in modern so-called low emissivity windows? That coating, which, I, which I've told you, is, a, is and it's part of the problem set, but it's it told you which is a, a conductor. It conducts electricity um, and is therefore reflective of of, of electromagnetic waves in certain, certain you know, mo, a, a, a normal conductor like metal is reflective of all electromagnetic waves because the electromagnetic waves are built out of the influences that, that push electric charges around. So when they encounter the, the metal, they shove the charges around in it, and that motion of charge in the metal gets rid of the original wave and reflects, creates a new wave going backwards, reflected version. So um, electromagnetic waves bounce around in a metal box, like in the microwave oven. It's all a metal box. And, the, and they, they feed in microwaves through a, a hole, in a sense. And then it, they just bounce around until they are absorbed by the food. All right, so metals reflect, or conductors really, reflect electromagnetic waves. And the transparent conductors are weird conductors. They're conductors that are limited in how, in how fast their charges can respond. And so it is possible to go too fast, up and down and up and down and up and down with a wave, and therefore not have the, have the conductor throw up his hand and say, I can't deal with this. And that's what happens with these transparent conductors, is they can't, they can't reflect uh, a, a visible light. They can reflect light with lower frequency. It's, it's slower in its, its uh, period, in its, in, its, yeah, in its rhythm. So. In, if, if you could see transparent conductors in the infrared, you would see they, are, they look like mirror surfaces. And that is the case for your laptops and stuff like that. They, they, they reflect uh, ultra, uh, infrared light. So that said, if you, if you go up to, a, to a, a window that has one of these coatings in it, and you shine an infrared flashlight on that coating, really, you'll see a, a wonderful reflection. 
Uh, you can't actually do this because you would have to be shining your infrared light through one of the panes of glass to get at the coating, and it won't go through the glass. Okay, so it's, you have to break the window to do this. That said, then, so what you see when you look at a window is, has approximately nothing to do, and I, the word approximately is important, as I'll come to, approximately nothing to do with the coating. It's just the entry and exit of the glass. Is that okay? Light's changing speed. Now, what about the approximately? The approximately is this. That coating is tailored to be reflective in the infrared, transparent in the visible, but nothing makes these transitions perfectly. Like, like it's just, go, you know, from this part of the spectrum over, perfect reflector. This, from here over, perfect transmitter. There's always some mucky muck in the middle, okay? And here's, here's the thing to look for. Next time you go looking at windows, at, at, at low, you know, ideally low emissivity windows, look at the colors of the reflections you see in them. And they, you may see multiple reflections. This is true of modern windows because they've got so many surfaces. They've got four surfaces in them. First pane, front and back. Second pane, front and back. There are four reflections to, work, to worry about. And they're not always overlapped perfectly. And I have a chair I sit in a lot at home, and I see a particular pane of glass, a double pane, low emissivity coating in it, and it reflects a, a, a light, a lamp, our, our front lamp, the one that you, know, you turn on, the, the lamp sits out there, and, every, and it says, we're home, come on in, that, kind of, that lamp. That lamp's reflected in, that, in the window, and I see it. And I see two images of it, and one of them is greenish. And What's, why is it greenish? It's, that's the low emissivity coating, mucking up the colors. It's not, it's pretty transparent, but it's not quite perfect. And in reflection, it's weird. It, so it reflects the, it reflects the, the image of this, this lamp, uh, taints the color. It, it evidently reflects the green portion of the spectrum more strongly than it reflects uh, some of the other parts of the, so, it introduces weird colors. And this kind of thing you'll see in general from windows. If you look, at, if you look carefully at low emissivity windows, they're going to have some weird color aspects to them, particularly in the reflections. That's also true of uh, reflection-coated glasses or camera lenses. If you, get, if you have a fancy camera, the, that camera also will have anti-reflection coatings on all of its glass surfaces because having the random reflections bouncing around inside the complicated lens will introduce trouble on the final image. So they're all coated, and they all look funny in color, particularly in the reflections. My glasses look a little purple in reflection. Is that okay? Long story, somewhat off topic, but eh, you may as well know it. That said, we can move on from the world of insulation and so on, and climate, to air conditioning, and I, and I just barely touched in this last time. And the idea, you know, the big question is like, how does an air conditioner manage to do this, what seems to like violate everything I've ever talked about, this trick of, of moving heat from your indoor air, which is already, from your indoor air to the outside, that already, that already gives away something. The fact that, the, that the, it's moving heat from the indoor air and it's not like destroying it. It's doing something with it. It's moving it. It's moving it outdoors. And that is a weird thing to be doing why? Because the indoor air is getting cooler, and it's becoming the coolest thing around. I mean, not to judge it like, ooh, that's cool. It's cold. It's the coldest thing around, and the outdoor air is, is getting hotter and becoming the hottest thing around. So we've got heat moving the wrong way, from cold to hot. That is not the way it moves naturally. That, and, and, okay, it's not the way it moves naturally. I will remind you that, I, that I've told you that the movement of heat from hot to cold is driven not by the laws of motion. The, 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 you, is, there's no Newton's law that says heat may not accelerate to the right and move, you know. Eh, that's not, that's ro the wrong, wrong tools. It's a statistical problem. It's statistically unlikely for heat to flow from the wrong way. It always goes from hot to cold statistically. That, that's, 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 that's statistically likely. The reverse is statistically unlikely. So it's a weird thing to, to, to be able to do. Obviously, you can do it because we all 
you know, experience air conditioning and things related to air conditioning, which include refrigeration. You know, how do you manage to make, you don't have to save ice from the, from the winter anymore. You, you can turn on the, air, on the refrigerator. It, uh, question came in, is that reflection coating also how a rear view mirror works if you tilt it downward? So those of you who have, who have played with the, the, the little lever on most rear view mirrors now have, have discovered or been told or that, the, that if, you, if you tip it differently, you see a much dimmer reflection of what's behind you. So you, there's, a, there's a, 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 a high intensity reflection and then there's a dim reflection. And you use the dim reflection at night so that the dazzling lights coming up from the cars behind you don't just, they're not, they're not dazzling, all right? This is exactly related to what I just talked about. It's not a coating issue, though. It is, it is the partial reflection that comes with, with, uh, with entering glass, with light entering glass. The, the strong reflection is, comes from a mirrored coating on the, on the back side of, of, a, of a plate of glass, actually a wedge of glass, that, that, a coating that you can't touch because it's on the wrong side of the glass. You, know, you go up there, touch the, you touch the uh, rear view mirror, you're touching pure glass. On the far side, some of them are millimeters away from where you touch. That's where the coating is. And it's just normal metallic coating. And that gives you a bright, the bright reflection. The dim reflection that you see when you, when you tilt it funny, tilt it differently, that's the reflection not off the metal surface, but off the front surface, off the glass itself. And that's about a 4% reflection because of the, the amount to which the light slows down in entering the glass. It's about a 4% reflection and it heads a different direction from the, from the other direction because the glass is not too flat. It's not flat on both sides. It's flat, it's, it's flat on both sides, but they're not parallel. It's wedged. The, it's, it's a strange piece of glass that's cut uh, thinner at one end than the other. And so you're seeing, as you tilt it, you're, 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 you're bringing a, a different reflection toward your eye. Either the, either the strong reflection from the met, metalized mirror or the weak reflection from the front surface of the glass. Is that okay? All right. Um, you know, somebody's patent way back when, and nice invention. Okay, so, so with, with the air conditioner, so it's doing the weird thing of moving heat the wrong way. How is that even possible at all? So let me show it to you. I, I did it last time, I'll do it again, and I'll, I'll talk through it better. That, that it is possible to really play with, with uh, thermal energy and to change temperatures. So it's not inevitable that everything goes to the same temperature. Uh, that if all, heat, all we can do with heat is let it flow from hot to cold, it's gonna flow from hot to cold until there's no more possibility of flowing from hot to cold because everything's at the same temperature. That's the boring end of the road possibility if that's, uh, if that's, if that's the only thing he can do is flow from hot to cold. Everything goes to the same temperature and then it's dull from, it, from then on. So we can make something that's especially hot. We, well, we always knew that. That was easy. That was just uh, take or ordinary th work and just grind it up into thermal energy. You can just do that by rubbing your hands together. So making something that's especially hot is easy. Making something that's colder than everything else around is hard. But you can do it. And so here's a way of doing it. And so rather than tell you why it works, I'll show you that it does work, and then we'll come back and see why it works. The idea is this. That if you take a gas, everybody's favorite gas, just, well, maybe it's their second favorite gas, and it's air, and I don't know what the first one is, I'll leave it alone. Um, it, it, air, if you take air and you, and you compress it, which involves pushing, grabbing hold of it in some container and pushing the container to smaller volume, that involves doing work. So however I do it, if I want to compress air from so the air, instead of occupying this, this volume, it occupies this volume. I have to do work on it. No alternatives. And if I do work on it, that means I give it energy. And the only thing a gas can do with the energy is to, to you have it as thermal energy. It gets hotter. The gas gets hotter. So when I pump air into this container, the temperature, as measured over there on that vertical scale there, uh, goes up. So what you're seeing here is that as the little lights move up the column, that was, that was the, 
yeah, of course, now it's going to go the other way, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. That was my work done by pumping the bicycle pump, which again follows work force. And I'm exerting force on it, it's moving in distance, direction force, the whole, the whole story. And that ended up in the, in the gas, in the bottle, and its temperature went up. It then became sort of the hottest thing around. Another judgment. Um, it, it just, it, its temperature rose. And so heat begins to flow out of it into the, the wider air because heat flows from hot to cold. And it's the hottest thing, right? So, so that was what was happening while, before, before the cork came out. Let me put the cork in better. So let me pump the cork, pump in the gas, okay? Yeah, there's maybe a little friction around, but that's not the issue. It's the, it's the compressing the air, and I did it, okay? I compressed the air. This is now hot air in there. I mean, not terribly hot, but hotter. And heat is now flowing the good old-fashioned way from the hot air to the ordinary room temperature air outside, settling down, okay? So the temperature now meandered back down to normal. And it overshot because of leaks and stuff. That's, but the basic idea is this will get hot while I pump air in. When I stop pumping air in, if it's totally sealed, nothing's changing, the heat will flow out, and it will go back to room temperature. So far, so good? All right. The cork does come flying. Yeah, Wes? Is there any noticeable difference in the, in the bottle while well, I'm pumping air? In this case, no. But We'll come to a case in, in, in the context of, of uh, automobiles where it is very noticeable, where it would get really hot. Okay? So here it's probably a, a couple of degrees, um, but you can make it 1,000 degrees if you like. You just got to pump hard. I'm not going to pump that hard. Okay? So it gets hotter, heat flows out. When the cork pops out, so, so we'll assume it sort of it drifted somewhat back to room temperature, and then the cork pops out. When the cork pops out, the, the gas goes from being compressed into a, into a you know, tightly packed to it, it pushes its way back to, to its original volume, approximately. And to do that, it has to shove not me out of the way, not my bicycle pump out of the way, but the surrounding air out of the way, because it has to make room for itself. And so it does work on the, other, on the air in this room. To, to, to go back to normal pressure and density. And when that happens, it has to use its store of energy to do that, to move everything out of the way, make room for itself. And that involves doing work on the environment, and its energy goes down. And the only, way, the only energy it had to work with was its thermal energy, so its thermal energy goes down. It gets colder. So that's why this is a, you know, this is a full service, full cycle operation. As I pump air in, the temperature goes up because I'm doing work on it. And heat is now bleeding out of the bottle into the room. And there goes the cork. And now it did work on the room very fast, actually. And its temperature, which is it's taking time for it to show you the temperature drop, the temperature is dropping below room temperature. It's becoming the coldest thing around. And heat is now flowing into it the other way around. And you do it right. I can get it to go off scale. Last, yesterday I got it go flying right off scale on the bottom. Up you go. And down you go. OK? So the effect works for reasons that hopefully you can understand. And I can now make an air conditioner, OK? A really primitive air conditioner. And that consists of, here, just a bottle, sealed bottle of air. So the air, I'm, I'm going to leave that, those air molecules in the, the whole story. What I'm going to do, I want to air condition our room. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk out of the room, and I won't go all the way, but I'll go, you know, okay, over here. And now I'm going to compress the air. I'm going to do work on it, compress the air in the bottle by squeezing it. So now I pack the air more tightly. I did do work on it. The temperature of the air went up, just like in the bottle. This is now the hottest thing around, and heat will now flow out of it into the, out, you know, the hall air until this is basically hall air temperature. Okay? I walk in here with hall air temperature that's compressed, and I uncompress it. And now it got cold because it did work to make room for itself again. So it's the coldest thing around, and heat is now flowing out of the room air into it. And I go back and do it again. 
squeeze, unsqueeze, squeeze, unsqueeze. Is that okay? This is actually how they liquefy, uh, make liquid nitrogen. Obviously not with a bottle and some jerk walking back and forth, but, but they, they do it, this is, with a little bit of a complication, they basically take air and they squish it like crazy. So it gets very hot and becomes very hot high, hot, high density air. They let the heat then bleed out into some dump. That they, that into the, in, you know, into the, room, into the room, but probably beyond that. I don't know where they, what they do with the heat. They now have very high pressure, uh, essentially room temperature air, and they let it do work on a, on, you know, expand, do work on some device, give away its energy, and the temperature plummets. And in principle, it can plummet so far that the temperature drops to the point where liquid nitrogen becomes, li liquid air becomes uh, uh, possible, and, and you can get an equilibrium between the gaseous air and the liquid air and start to condense some of the air. In reality, they probably use more than one, this is, this is a refrigeration concept, and they probably use more than one stage of this refrigeration concept. They, have, they get the air cold with the first stage, so they're working now, instead of with room temperature air, they're working with air that's already bitter cold, and they do it again, and they get down to liquid nitrogen temperature. But I think that, that's basically the idea behind making liquid air. Um, to, make it, to turn that into liquid nitrogen, they distill away the oxygen, and that's just, they're, they're using the same concepts that they use to make, uh, well, well to, make, to make spirits, you know, whiskey and whatever. You can, you can selectively take molecules out of a liquid and uh, produce another liquid or, or the remaining liquid. Anyway, they take the oxygen out and keep the nitrogen. All right? So you can actually make a refrigerator this way. And, oh, I should say, air conditioning and refrigeration, all the same thing. Uh, your refrigerator is essentially an air conditioner for a little box. It makes a really chill room for, for mice, okay? For, you know, for a guinea pig. So it's the same device. Um, the real refrigerators, use a, are a little more your normal refrigerators. Not for, make, for making liquid nitrogen, you, you've got to use this approach. For making a house cool, you can be more clever in your choice of the, of the gas that you compress and decompress. So instead of using air, you can use a, a, a material that, in particular, can, can convert from a gas to a liquid and a liquid to gas. That's actually very a very useful effect. And we'll, I'll come to that later. I won't do that now. All right. What I want to do now is, is, is give you an idea of, okay, so, so what are the rules governing this, this, this stuff I'm playing with? How, the, how does it work? Does that mean that, a, that the glass container is a good thermal conductor? Ah, ah. okay, so the question about, about, about th this. Th this, my, my, my uh, stop. The idea that the heat flows out of the container into the room when I'm pumping it in, right? And then heat flows into the container from the room. Question about the wall of the container. Glass container would be, is, is a poor choice for this, for this demonstration if, it were, if we're really doing this. If we're really trying to move heat in and out of, of that container, glass is a crummy choice because it's not a very good conductor of heat. It's, you know, it's, not, it's not terrible, it's not, as, it's not as bad as gases themselves, but it's better than well, yeah, so it's, it's, but we can do better. Yeah, Pauline? The question about the, the, the reaction times, that, that, the temp, that the time it takes for this device to indicate the temperature has gone up, it's taking a few seconds to get up there, right? And now it popped. It seems to take a few seconds to get to go down. I think the reaction time is primarily the, the slow response of the, of the little thermometer that's in there. It probably takes several seconds for it to, to come into thermal equilibrium with the air around it. Um, so that's probably part of the influence. Part of the, additionally, there probably, there's probably convection issues and all sorts of 
of funny things that slow down the response of all this stuff. So when that cork popped, it should get cold quite quickly. The sudden, the sudden expansion of the gas will drop its temperature in, in a fraction of a second. It just may take a very long time for everything else to sort of notice that. You've, you may well have seen this, these effects associated with very sudden uh, expansion of, of, of air. If there's a lot of moisture in the air, that sudden expansion and drop in temperature can call, cause the moisture to, to condense right, right in the middle of the air, poof, like a cloud just pops into existence. And this happens frequently in, in airplanes, in and around airplanes. The air can expand all of a sudden as it goes from, from high pressure to low pressure in, in its flow. And we've already talked about how, how air does go from high pressure to low pressure. There are temperature effects to this change, this, these changes in pressure, ones that I ignored during the section on, on airplanes, but they're actually there. And those sudden drops in temperature can cause con condensation. And so if, if you ever see sudden, con su sudden clouds just like appear around the wings of a plane, that's the, that's the decompression effect. I'm trying to think where else you would see this. And that's the main one. Is that okay? So regarding the thermal conductivity of the, of, the, of the bottle, terrible choice for an air conditioner. Use metals. Use, for example, copper or aluminum. And this is essentially a refrigerator. It's, technically, it is, a, it is a dehumidifier that we tore apart, but they're all the same machine. It has a place that gets cold. It has a place that gets hot and it has a device that makes that all happen, and they're made of aluminum. Aluminum there, uh, that is aluminum, is, I think it's aluminum with aluminum fins. Lots of metal trying to get the heat to move easily. All right, I'll come to why, why that, how that all works down the road. But, but yeah, real, real refrigeration systems use good thermal conductors to, to exchange heat with the environment. Not, not crummy ones like glass. Okay, so to, 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 to explain the rules that govern this, the, the manipulation of thermal energy and, and heat, uh, those rules have, have an appropriate name. They're called the laws of thermodynamics. And, and for some reason or other, the thermodynamics have, have this bad reputation as being completely inscrutable, you know, hopeless thing. Oh, we're studying thermodynamics now. Oh, no, no. Um, it just shouldn't be that bad. So here, so here are the rules. And, I'll, and I, okay, I'll sort of break my, my at least my goal of, of putting everything in context from the get-go, which I don't, I break all the time anyway. Okay, so the rules of thermodynamics, there are officially four of them. I'm only going to do three. The fourth one is, is kind of a mess. Um, there are only three. They're oddly, they're often uh, numbered. I mean, officially they're numbered. And for historical reasons, they're oddly numbered. They are numbered not one through four, but rather zero through three. And why zero? It's because they, met, they, they came up with one and two and probably three before they came up, before they realized, oh, oh we left one off at the beginning. And rather than try to renumber things, which is, is always hopeless, once, you, once there are a couple publications out there that have the, the old numbering, you know, bah, we're stuck. So, so we've got a zeroth law of thermodynamics. But I you know, set aside the numbers. I'll just name them. The first, sorry, first. The first law I'll talk about is called the law of thermal equilibrium. Secretly, it's, it's zero, OK? The law of thermal equilibrium, uh, in a simple formulation, there's always a lot of flexibility in how you say them. It, it just observes that if you've got two objects that, are in, that, are in, that do not exchange heat, when you touch them. And you take that one of those objects and you touch it to a third object and they don't exchange heat when you touch them. You can take the pair that you didn't touch and, and you know that when you touch them they won't exchange heat, heat either. So I should have three objects that I can do this with. This can, this bottle, and this eraser. Right? The they don't exchange heat. They don't exchange heat. What about this pair? <gasps> no, they don't exchange heat either. It, more generally, they're all three at the same temperature, because that's what it really means to be at the same temperature. Things at the same temperature do not exchange heat when you touch them. And 
it, this only leads to the whole concept of temperature. It, it underlies it's the foundation behind the whole concept of temperature and the idea that you can actually assign a temperature to everything and watch and predict the heat flow between them. Heat, heat never spontaneously flows from an object with a low temperature to an object with a high temperature. And heat never spontaneously flows between two objects with the same temperature. Okay, so that's the, that's the zeroth law. Ah, law of, law of thermal equilibrium. The next, the next law, finesse the numbers, is the law of conservation of energy. Uh, uh, so it's a wordy name, it sounds like old news. Because we know energy is conserved, of course, of course. But what it, what it, its reason for being is, is to bring heat into the, into the fold. Heat is thermal energy on the move, and heat carries energy. This, I mean, this was, if you go back 200 years, people didn't know what heat was. They thought it was some sort of weird fluid that moved from one thing to another. They gave it a name, they called it caloric, as, as best I remember. So they didn't realize it was, it was just good old fashioned energy just chopped up into little bitties. Uh, and one of the great proofs that, or demonstrations that, that, that heat is energy, a form of energy, was uh, when, when they were, would bore cannons, when they would drill out the, 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 the center of a cannon, uh, it made a lot of heat. It would get really hot, right? It's like friction city. And there was, it was inexhaustible. You never ran out of it. You could keep making more. Bore, you know, drill the hole some more, drill the hole some more. It kept making more heat. And you know, so this is one of the underlying demonstrations that, that led to this realization. It's just heat, OK? Similarly, you do work on, on, if you stir your coffee fast and hard enough and do work enough work on it, you will make the coffee hotter. All right, so, so that's the, the, the law of, of conservation of energy brings heat in. Officially, it is that the, the, the energy in an object, this box, is, can, can be changed by transferring, letting heat flow into it and by letting it do work out. I don't know what, they, they gave, it, the change in the box's energy is officially, according, the official formulation of that law is, the, the change in the energy is, is the heat in minus the work out. I don't know why they put all the complicated minus signs and stuff in, but they did. It doesn't matter. The real issue is that you can add energy to something by doing work on it, or you can add energy by transferring heat to it. Okay? It's the, it's the next law that's the real, um, the meaty one. And it's called the law of entropy. And I will inevitably slip and call it by its numerical name. It's the second law. Um, but so the law of entropy is really, uh, is, a, is a law based on the world of statistics, along with the observations of how the world works. But, but it ultimately, it, the, its, its story lies in statistics. And to give you an understanding of the law of entropy, I should first start by saying what entropy is. And I can even start further. I can say what it isn't. It is not energy. They sound a lot alike. Energy, entropy, um, they're nothing alike. They're just named similarly. You know, N, um, I can't help it, can't fix it. It is what it is. Don't confuse them. You can't turn energy into entropy or vice versa any more than you can turn apples into uh, automobiles. They start with A. All right. Um, entropy is the measure of the entropy of an, an object's entropy. It's a physical quantity. So objects have a specific amount of entropy. It's not a vector quantity, no direction. It's just an amount. And it is the measure of the object's disorder which is a weird thing to be measuring. And you know, like, why don't you measure order? Well, it's better to measure disorder. Um, order has a, oh, yeah. So it measures every type of disorder in an, in an object. So it, it will turn out, thermal energy is a major contributor to an object's disorder. Uh, thermal energy, because it's all sliced up and distributed statistically, is very hard to pin down. You don't know much about it. It lives within rules, but not much else. And so uh, it's very disordering, thermal energy is, to an object. But other disorders matter, like, like, 
like is it broken into biddies? Um, so for example, a vase before and after you drop it have different, different entropies. The smashed vase has a higher entropy than the unsmashed vase, even if they're at the same temperature. Is that okay? More disorder. Uh, and that said, uh, just as, a, as, a, as an observation, is that, that things tend to drift towards more and more disorder, which is to say a lot of you know, entropy te tends to increase. And we have to pin down the context in which it does increase. Um, if you start with very orderly things, like I did last time, I took a bunch of, of beans or, or, or um, beads, two different colors, and, and you, you start with them separated into a nice arrangement of all purple on one side, all white on the other side. If you start stirring, they get disordered. You lose control of it. The other thing about entropy is ultimately it, it's related to the amount of information required to fully describe the, the, the object whose entropy you're trying to work, you're working, uh, paying attention to. So for example, those beans, or beads, uh, it took very little, very few words to describe the original situation. All the purple beans to the left, all the white beans to the right, I guess I might have to tell you the number of beans and then we're done. But the amount of information required, very, very short, very brief. Anything I do to that, those beans is going to uh, make it so that I need to use more words to tell you what, what the situation is like. We're going to have 13 purples on the right you know, in the midst of the whites. You know, it's going to get more, more and more information needed to describe the situation. And, and as entropy increases, you, you get more and more information required. And there, there are actually mathematical connections between information and actually information theory and entropy. All right. So, the law of entropy then, what does it observe? It observes that in a thermally isolated system, and I'll come back to all the words, thermally isolated system, okay? The entropy of that system never decreases. So at the biggest picture, what that's, what that's saying is that if you take a system properly uh, bounded, within that system, it's always going to become more disorderly, or at the very best, it's just going to stay the same. It never gets l less orderly. And this is sort of common experience. You, you watch the leaves blowing around. Uh, after they, you know, they, go, they go clean up the leaves, and, and so the leaves are in nice piles and stuff like that, which is very orderly. Leave, leave that sis situation for any length of time and let any people walking through the, the air go by. It's going to go to disorder. It goes back to the mess that it was before they cleaned it up. It, that's just the nature of things, to, to develop more and more disorder. What about the words thermally isolated? The thermally isolated words are in there because you can, if you're allowed to move disorder around and basically throw it out of the system that you're paying attention to you, and export it, you can create, make the system more orderly. And that's, that's not interesting. That, that's, you know, that's not, the, the, the law of entropy doesn't, doesn't care. If, if you're willing to like throw out the trash, um, it, 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 the law of entropy says, fine, I'm not going to pay attention to you. The law of entropy, entropy only applies to a, to a system, some, some collection of objects, you know, an object or a collection of ob objects that are forbidden to exchange disorder with the world around them. And thermally isolated essentially says no disorder is allowed to move in or out of, this, out of this environment. So if you think of your dorm room, if the door is closed in your dorm room and you know, so, so nobody go in or out, it's going to get more and more disorderly as time goes on. Or at very best, it's just going to stay at the current d degree of disorder, current entropy. Um, but it, it, let anything happen, time evolve, it's going to get worse. And as long as you're not allowed to open the door and throw out all your, your roommate's junk, it's not going to get more orderly. All right? So, um, and, and that observation is entirely driven by statistics. I mean, for, yeah, I've, I've done the bean stories enough, and you know, just all kinds of contexts in which you, 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 you create orderly systems, which involves uh, exporting the disorder, ultimately. You create orderly systems. You organize your sock drawer into the various colors 
in, in, in sequence, if, you know, if you're really OCD. Okay, you do that, and, and uh, some whirlwind occurs, stirring the mess up, it's going to go to, to less order. You're gonna lose all this beautiful, the, the red socks here, the green socks there, the purple socks there, it's gonna all get messed up. And it's never gonna happen that another whirlwind will come in and stir it and it'll go back the way it was. It's just statistically very unlikely. Additionally, you can, you can observe, in effect, you can observe the, en the entropy content of a, of a, of a system uh, with your eyes to a, to a large extent. It not, you can't quantify it, but you can, watch, you can say which one has more entropy than the other, um, which, which version of the system. And, and my, my way of thinking about this is, is imagine t taking a series of photographs of some situation. You take one now, you take one in 10 minutes, you take one in a, an hour, and so on. You've got this whole series of photographs, and assuming that, that no cleaning person came in and, and tidied things up, uh, again, thermally isolated system. When you get those photographs, you can, you can put them in time order just by looking at, at, at the contents. Even if you scramble them, you can put them back in time order. The one that occurred first, the one that you know in your heart must have been the original situation, is the low entropy situation. It's the one that goes first. And subsequently, all of the next photographs are going to be higher and higher entropy, more and more disorder. Um, if I showed you two pictures, the vase sitting there, all intact, full of flowers, and another photograph, the same vase smashed on the floor, the flowers stepped on. T time order, you know which the time order is. So of course you're going to put the intact vase first, the broken vase second. And what you're doing when you're time ordering them in, in large part is you're, is you're assessing the entropy. You know that the intact vase is low entropy, low disorder, and the smashed one's high, order, high, uh, high disorder. All right, high entropy. All right, um, yeah, time gets away from me. What do I want to do? Isn't order and organization subjective? Uh, the ocean waves smoothing rocks. The, the, in fact, entropy is not subjective. It, it is a quantifiable thing. So, so uh, if you look at ocean waves smoothing rocks, the rocks get simpler to describe. However, they are missing parts. And the parts now of the rocks, that are not, the rocks are now smooth. And, Possibly we can describe them with less information. But the, but the pieces of the rocks that are missing are all over the place. They're now sand or something like sand. And to pin those down, because they're part of the system still, we can quibble about where the system ends. Uh, they require a whole lot more information. So we have a, we, smoothing something off by grinding away its surfaces, oh, creates a lot of entropy. Because the disorder of, 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 the, of the missing pieces. All right, so it, it, it is the case that you can, you can pin down entropy exactly in a system. And what I'll do next time, what, what, what I want to, I'll, I'll give you a preview of my, my boxes, my story about the boxes, is this is just a sort of a cartoon world of watching thermal energy move around and with it entropy move around. And we'll see that if, if you let heat flow from a, hot, from a hot object to a cold object, the heat flows and the, 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 the thermal energy content of the two objects sort of drift towards each other. And at the same time, you create entropy. The, the movement of heat, heat leaving a hot object, orders that hot object a little bit. Because the hot object has so much thermal energy in it, however, it doesn't really care about small increases or decreases in thermal energy. So little changes in thermal energy in a hot object have relatively little effect on its order, and therefore on its entropy. The cold object, though, is very sensitive. It's got to, to uh, additions or subtractions of thermal energy. Its entropy changes much more dramatically with addition or subtraction of thermal energy, because it's, it's got almost none. And so a little addition is a big change for it. A little subtraction is a big change for it. So if you watch heat flow from a hot object to a cold object, the Hot object gets a little more orderly, but not very much, because it's not very sensitive. 
And the cold object gets a lot more disorderly because it is very sensitive. And so overall, entropy increases. The cold object's entropy goes up by more than the hot object goes down. And entropy increases. Entropy is not a conserved quantity at all. It loves to go up. And that, that, it goes up, and, this, and the law of entropy is just wildly happy. This is great. Now, I agree, do this, do this. So heat flows from hot to cold. If you try to make heat flow the other way, from cold to hot, the entropy of the system goes down. And the law of entropy for, forbids this. So it's, it's driven by statistics. It never happens. That, you know, it never happens. 10 to the minus a bazillion, bazillion, bazillion chance that it'll ever happen, ne so, which, is, which is equivalent to never. So heat doesn't flow from cold to hot. All right, we'll go, we'll go back to, uh, over this on Friday.